Thank you. And uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. It has been a pleasure, but also a challenge to prepare this talk. And right now it's uh, quite a challenge just to stand here. Um, well, the challenge is because evidence-based feeding is a huge topic, but I choose to narrow it down to enteral feeding of the infant because I know there will be a very nice talk after this, only uh, in regards of parental nutrition and going through the new ESPN guidelines. So my name is Lisa. I am from this hospital, Copenhagen, situated here in Copenhagen. It's a tertiary level 4 NICU PICU. We have 33 intensive care beds and cover an age band uh, between 0 to 2 years of age. And we take care of immature birth from gestational age uh, 23 to 28 and other high risk birth in the eastern part of Denmark and then all congenital heart diseases born uh, in Denmark. We are the only ECMO service centre and within our uh, department we have a retrieval team for critical ill infants and children up to two years of age. So that was just an introduction to where I work. Uh, I of course have no disclosures. Um, an outline for today will be a little bit about basics and then we will go into more details about maturity of the intestine, growth and development, immunity and different feeding strategies. I will try to do a sum up and then discuss just a little bit about the guidelines and you may then ask me lots of questions. Um, the purpose of feeding. So when you're born immature, as you can see on the figure, both your gut and your lungs are of course uh, not fully developed. Um, the gut will not develop actually until very close to birth. And if you think about the brain, the brain will only uh, develop after birth actually and, and quite slowly. So what we aim for when we give feeding after a preterm birth is to not only promote growth of the infant in, in regards of body weight and length and head circumferences, but also to promote the uh, maturity of uh, the organs. And then, of course, we also want to do, uh, use different strategies that um, make us uh, not having uh, necrotizing enterocolitis or infections. And we also want to do strategies that avoid metabolic diseases later in life. Um, this is a picture of the crypt villus axis, which is the most important uh, uh, area, if you can say so, in the intestine. And this is made from proliferation, differentiation, and maturation. And at the bottom, you, of the bottom of the uh, crypt here, you will see the stem cells. And from this, you will have a uh, differentiation of the four major epithelial cells. The three of them will um, migrate into the villus, as you can see up here and the enterocyte, which are the absorptive cells and the goblet cells and the enter endocrine cells you will find here and these are very important for of course absorption of uh, of uh, nutrients and development and then at the bottom of the crypt you will have the panet cells which are the protective cells and this uh, proliferation maturization uh, lengthening and uh, differentiation is stimulated by these factors and during the interuterine life, especially EGF, IGF and TGF factors, as well as insulin, are the ones that promote this uh, growth. After birth, it will be the growth hormone and the uh, nutrient-stimulated interluminal hormones, as well as GLP-2, that will um, further develop the, the uh, intestine. And GLP-2 is the most potent bioactive factor that influences the intestine. The growth of a baby and in terms of length and weight is a very dynamic and, and also very complex process in the uterine life. And in the beginning, it's more the genome that is uh, uh, the, the major determinant of, of growth. And then later on, also IGF and insulin will be affecting uh, the growth. So when the baby is born premature, you might think that we should try to mimic uh, the growth of the baby in the same way as it is going in the interuterine life. But as Eran Khan showed uh, some years ago now, uh, he studied uh, around about uh, um, 1,700 infants between gestational age 24 and 29 and a birth weight between 500 and 1,500 grams. And you could quite nicely see here that the exuterine growth is not at all mimicking the interuterine growth. And that is very important when we 
aim for growth uh, and when we also design our studies uh, in terms of uh, looking at how we can improve growth uh, with our nutrition. Now you should take out your phones because you need to answer a question. So uh, the next three following growth curves, which one of these will be optimal for the preterm infants? And I, I will take it slowly. Is it A? Or is it B? Or is it C? Yes, of course, um, or I don't know whether I can actually. Yes, okay, let's go back. So is it A? Looks quite nicely in some ways, right? And, or is it B? Or is it C? Great, B is the right answer. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Um, what does it actually mean when something is evidence-based? Well, you can look upon it as a three-legged chair. So if you have the best available research and combine it with uh, clinician expertise and then the patient's preferences and values, then you will actually have evidence-based knowledge. Um, when it comes to nutrition, I think we need to combine animal science with human science. And one of the reasons that I think so is because when you do study nutrition in very detailed um, parts, uh, for instance, if you want to study the effects of one uh, specific amino acid or the heating process of, of a product, it's very difficult uh, to do so in humans. It's very difficult to look very closely into the target organs and it is also very, very time consuming. And you need a lot of, lot of numbers to, to test things like that. But animal sciences, of course, uh, cannot stand alone. Of course, you also have to do human studies and you really have to think about what kind of animal you use as a model for your uh, preterm infant when you, when you go into animal science. Because as you can see in the picture here, the rat, uh, it's very nice to, to sort of use as a model because you can have a lot of them uh, on the same time. But they are not really very good at being delivered prematurely. And they have a very uh, different um, way of maturing compared to the human. If you look upon the pig, and the pig and the lamb is actually a little bit the same, um, you can deliver these prematurely and the um, organs are not developed in the same way, but they're prematurely developed as well uh, as in the humans. So these animals mimic um, humans quite well. And now we will go into different studies of humans and animals and then look upon the different parts of what we aim for with the nutrition. So this is a study where we want to look upon the maturity of the intestine. And this is a piglet study, 90% um, prematurely <coughs> delivered, which uh, in terms of the intestine is round about gestation on age 28 uh, weeks. They were divided into three groups. One group had uh, formula, another one had donor milk, and that was human donor milk. And then uh, the third group had bovine colostrum. And in each group, there were uh, between 14 and 18 piglets. They were fed gradually over 11 days and during that time the parental nutrition was uh, reduced. Every day they had their clinical uh, status uh, assessed, they had anthropometrics measured, the activity and the bacterial um, and the activity was measured on euthanization, bacterial load, uh, brush border enzyme activity, intestinal uh, image, uh, immunity and inflammation markers were assessed and they had all had a next score. And you can use the uh, brush border enzyme activity as a marker of um, maturity of the intestine. And 
uh, in the figure on the right, you can see in white the uh, piglets who received infant formula and in gray the piglets that received uh, donor milk and in black the piglets that received bovine colostrum. And as you might see, most of the piglets receiving bovine colostrum had a very nice uh, increase in enzyme activity in nearly all the enzyme measured. So they concluded from this that bovine colostrum in increasing uh, amounts uh, would stimulate the maturity or, or you know, stimulate maturity of, of the intestine. It's very difficult to look upon the intestine in humans this way because we cannot take it out, of course. So we have to have other markers of maturity of the intestines in humans and there are different biomarkers and, and in this uh, group they choose urinary uh, intestinal fatty acid bi binding protein which is a protein you can find in the urine of course. And um, that can be um, measured quite easily uh, and without no uh, stress for the baby, that's why they choose this one. And um, they had 40 infants with a median age of uh, 30 plus 1, gestational age, and a median weight of uh, 400 grams. And they measured uh, um, IFAB on day 5, 12, 19 and 26. And they divided the infants into two groups. 21 was exclusively breastfed, 19 was exclusively, ex exclusively formula fed, and in each group they had 10 boys. And as you can see on the figure, that IFAP uh, increased from day uh, 5 to 12, uh, remarkably in the group only receiving breast milk, and on, not until day, from uh, day, day 12 to day 19, we had an increase in IFAP in the formula fat, but in the end, it was actually the same. So um, they concluded that breastfeeding uh, stimulates the intestine of the uh, premature baby uh, faster, but, uh, but uh, there will be no difference in the end uh, between uh, what kind of uh, food you will choose. Moving on to uh, growth and organ development, this is a very difficult study actually to perform because you have to um, teach the pigs to, to do different things. But they investigated uh, 112, 90% uh, premature piglets and 56 perm, uh, term piglets. Um, one group were only fed parental nutrition and the other group were fed minimal enter nutrition with uh, bovine colostrum and of course also uh, parental nutrition to keep a nice hydration for five days and after that they were all switched to, to raw milk. And then on day 4, 9, 16 and 23 they assessed the ability to coordinate and day 16 and 24 they assessed the uh, ability to recognize and on day 25 they assessed their ability to um, remember their cognition. And um, that connect cognition test uh, is what you see on this picture here. And that is a difficult task for the piglets. They have to be trained for that. So they were trained from day 17 to day 20. And then they should try to forget it. And then they should come back. And what they do when they then assess whether they were clever or not so clever is they measure uh, the time to enter this uh, cage. So the piglets were put out here and then they were uh, measuring the time to come in here. And uh, what they were trained for is they were trained to, to do a poke in each of the sides and um, then they measured the time to do this first poke. And if we just look upon uh, the weight at first. You can see down here on this figure that from day one to five the preterm piglets, which are the white ones, uh, did not really gain much weight. Um, in the end they had a very nice catch-up, um, but if you look on the other side, in general the preterm piglets do not really grow very well. So from that they concluded that prematurity uh, induces uh, growth restriction. Also, when they look upon the um, ability to remember, um, you can see again in white, it takes a, a longer time for the premature piglet to enter the cage, and it takes quite a long time for them to do the first poke. So again, they um, concluded that prematurity 
um, induces uh, delayed neurodevelopment. We cannot train infants like that, uh, of course. So if we want to do a cognition test of an infant, we have to wait quite a long time. Um, but that is, of course, what we do in between uh, the waiting time to we can do Bailey scores. We can do uh, MRIs, for instance, which they did in this study. Uh, 131 infants with a gestational age below 31. Um, they had a very fixed uh, nutrient um, protocol that they were uh, using and the intake and the growth was uh, followed for four weeks and then again um, at uh, uh, discharge. And at discharge or when they were term, they had an MRI. And they did then at two years of age, uh, a Bailey 3 score uh, and uh, measured their cognitive and motor scores. And as you can see uh, on these upper figures here, um, the volume of the cerebellum was uh, positively correlated with the intake of both protein, fat and uh, calories. And if you look up on the lower figure here, you can see that the cumulative protein intake gave a better both cognitive and motor score in this uh, study. So they concluded that uh, a good uh, nutrient or a good um, enteral feeding is important and that protein is very important for uh, uh, growth of the, uh, of the brain or development of the brain. Uh, then you could think maybe we should just give a lot of protein, um, but maybe we shouldn't. There are also side effects to proteins. And in this um, study, they were only looking upon weight. And again, 60 preterm infants, gestational age below 32 and uh, birth weight above uh, below uh, 1,500 grams. Um, 30 of these had uh, 3.5 grams per kilogram per day of protein and 15 had 4.5 gra uh, grams per kilogram per day protein uh, from a fortifier uh, standardized uh, and the other 15 had it individualized. So they were measuring the mother, the content of protein in the mother's milk and then they uh, fortified up to uh, 4.5. 4 and they only looked upon growth. And as you can see, there were absolutely no difference between uh, the two groups uh, in either weight or head circumference. So maybe more protein is not the way to go. So we will move on now to immunity because this is really important for us when we do enteral feeding. We, we want to stimulate the intestine, but we don't want to overload it and we really don't want to see uh, any NEC. Um, in this experiment, this is again a pig, uh, piglet experiment, or actually it's three experiments. They had a, a comparison of IUGR with uh, normal weight, and that is of course because we often think that uh, IUGR piglets should maybe not have as much food in the beginning as the others, and um, maybe they are also more predisposed to have NEC. In the first uh, group, they, or in the first experiment, they had 12 pairs of uh, term piglets with either IUGR or, uh, or normal weight. They were fed enterally for only two days and then they were euthanized. And um, they did, in the middle here, you see the pictures of the intestines and uh, what they found was that the cryptvillus axis was uh, significantly lower in the IUGR piglets compared to the um, term piglets, but in any other ways they were uh, studying these, there were no difference between the two groups. In experiment two, they were now preterm piglets delivered, again, 90% uh, um, preterm, and that is because that is how far you can actually go with the piglet. And they were fed entry also for two days with either formula or colostrum. And then again, they were euthanized. And uh, in the third experiment, they again had uh, either IUGR or normal weight piglets, preterm uh, birth. But instead of enteral feeding in the beginning, they had two to three days of parental nutrition, but with no enteral nutrition. And then after that, they were having uh, two days of enteral nutrition with either colostrum or formula. And in the preterm piglets, again, 
Up here you can see uh, a picture of the intestine. They had um, a shorter cribulous axis compared to the, uh, that was the uh, IUGR piglets compared to the normal weight. But overall, the uh, neck score between the two groups were the same. But if you looked only upon the ones who had uh, parental nutrition for the first three days, they had more NEC than the piglets who had uh, intranutrition in the first days. And if you have formula, uh, you will uh, have pr um, a higher score of NEC compared to the ones having colostrum. And this is a very severe uh, score of NEC in, in the case of formula. So the question is, is it the same in, in the infants? And um, I think we all know that uh, now, but this, um, this very nice study, the Domino study, where they looked upon 336 uh, preterm piglets with a gestational age of uh, 28 and birth weight uh, of 992. They were comparing again donor milk to uh, a formula feeding for 90 days or, or until discharge and that was when mother's milk was not at all uh, available. And they were actually doing this to um, assess the cognitive uh, scores again uh, by Bailey 3. Uh, at a corrected age of 18 months. They also had a secondary uh, outcome with the, the language and the motor score uh, and mortality and mobility. And in all other cases, except from NEC, they found no difference between uh, donor milk or formula. But they found that if you have formula, you are more predisposed to have NEC. And that was both, all, that was all stages of NEC. Uh, and uh, this very nice uh, meta-analysis could uh, confirm that uh, breastfeeding or human milk uh, at least is in favor uh, when you want to study upon NEC. And that is even when you put in the two trials where you do fortification. There are uh, unfortunately not so many trials yet uh, looking upon that. So, so we know now that we want to give mother's milk, but from this study, we also know that uh, the amount of protein in, in mother's milk is not enough uh, to feed the infant. This is a study of 736 milk samples in 214 mothers who all gave birth to very premature infants. And as you can see in the first two weeks, um, there is a nice, or not so nice, drop in uh, protein content of the mother's milk from about two grams per 100 milliliters to 1.8 grams per 100 milliliters. And then it gradually slows, uh, uh, it, uh, drops to around about 1.2 grams per, per 100 milliliter. When it comes to fat and um, energy, it's relatively stable, but there's a huge variety within each mother you can see. In donor milk, we know there is a medium of a one gram per 100 milliliters of uh, protein. So that will definitely not be enough to, to uh, serve a, a right amount of protein for the baby. So you need to fortify your milk. Um, so now we know again from the either very low birth weight uh, infants or extremely low birth weight infants, the preferred uh, food it will be human milk. And in this study, they found that the first feed, or they stated that the first feed should be given within six to 48 hours of life in both of the groups. Um, you could either choose to feed every one hour or every second hour um, in one group, of course, a little bit less than in the other group, again, taking into account that these babies are extremely low birth weight. And then they sort of don't really know exactly if it's one or two or three or four days, you should give mineral internutrition before you start your advancement. But they think that in the two groups, you should uh, gradually increase your volume of food slower in the extreme low birth weight group compared to the very low birth weight group. 
And maybe that's the truth. We don't know yet, but maybe we will when this study is uh, published. Because in the SIFT study, which is speed of increasing milk fluid, it's a randomized trial. Um, I think they, well, I know they uh, already um, completed this study in the UK. It's a multicenter uh, RCT where they do either th uh, 30 mils per kilogram per day or 18 mil uh, mils per kilogram per day. And these babies are all below um, 32 weeks of gestational age and under 1500 grams. And there's a lot of babies in this study. Uh, they aim for 2,800 from uh, over 30 neonatal units in UK and Ireland. And I'm really looking forward to this. I know their primary outcomes are um, of uh, neurodevelopment, but they have uh, lots of very nice secondary outcomes. So. Um, this will be quite interesting and maybe we will change the way we think about increments of uh, enteral feeding. So now, now you have to come up here, Francesco. <coughs> yes, because we need to take a picture. <coughs> oh, you already did? Great. So this is not a poll. This is actually something that I need to put into my publication. So you have to really focus on this uh, question. <laughs> because I want to know whether uh, you do aspiration in your NICU. So do you do aspiration before each meal? Do you know, don't you know if you do it? Do you do two times per day? Do you do one time per shift or one time per day? What about never? Never is not an option. <laughs> yeah. Then you should just say, I don't know. Never is not an option. No. So if you don't do it, that's I will just congratulate you on that one. And then you must say, I don't know. All right. That's what I thought. Okay, good. So um, this question is important because lots of people do aspiration before each meal. And you could see the majority of the people in here also think they do that. Um, and that is disturbing for the infant. And that is also um, reducing the time to full intrafeeding. It gives a, a poorer growth and it gives a longer time on parental nutrition. So you actually also increase your uh, risk of having infection. So what we did was we uh, performed a focus group interview to make a questionnaire so that we could find out how it actually is uh, performed in Denmark. And after the questionnaire was developed and uh, validated, we did an electronic survey. So uh, this was sent to all nurses and doctors working in neonatal departments in Denmark. And that was 986 uh, receivers of the questionnaire. We had 96% uh, of responders and 94 of them reported that they evaluate gastric residuals as a standard procedure before every meal. So that was a little bit more than you just uh, said. That's, that's good for you. Um, and the reason for what it, why they do this is that nurses really do this because they think or they uh, feel that they can be assured that the tube is in the right position. Um, before they give the next meal. Doctors um, want, just want to know what the volume is. And there might be more reasons for that. So next question, and this is also going into the publication. So again, you must focus. So what do you fear the most if you find a green stayed uh, gastric residual? Or if your nurse find a green stained gastric residual? What? At a preterm, yes.
Yes? Good. Looks a little bit like this. So, um, again, we do it. We don't, maybe we don't know why we're doing it, actually. But nurses for definitely, they think that they, uh, if they find a green-stained uh, gastric residual, they must fear NEC. And you did the same. So, um, doctors are not so sure. Maybe it could be NEC, it could also be ileus. But actually, most of them are not really worried about this. They, they, they think maybe a green-stained gastric residual is just a green-stained gastric residual. So what we did then was we went back into the piglet facilities because we wanted to know whether gastric volumes or, gastric res or, uh, or a green-stained uh, um, gastric residual could be um, a sign of NEC. So we took 319 piglets from 20 different studies and at euthanasia we weighed the body weight, uh, the weight the body, and we measured the volume of the gastric residuals and we measured bile acid and other things as well. And then we did an NEC score, which is a standardized way to look upon the intestines of a pitlick. And then we divided those into different parts of the intestines uh, because piglets actually most often have um, <laughs> NEC in their colon. Uh, so, so we had to sort of divide it into uh, the small intestine and colon. And as you can see here, um, when you have NEC, your gastric residuals go up. And that is no matter whether it's in the uh, small intestine or in the colon. Um, and if you look upon only the small intestine, when you have a higher score of NEC, your gastric residual is uh, larger and larger. So we thought, okay, maybe it is actually a good idea to do uh, aspiration before each meal so we can be assured that, um, that the baby's not developing NEC just before uh, we, we give another feeding. But then we did a positive predictive value and positive predictive neg um, negative predictive uh, value test. And as you can see, uh, gastric residual volumes Testing that is just flipping a coin. You can't really use it for anything. And the same results were, uh, were uh, for the green stained residuals. So I don't think volume and uh, color or anything else is a very good marker of uh, necroticizing endocolitis. So I just want to summarize a little bit about what I said. I think if you want to do uh, evidence-based uh, knowledge upon um, nutrition, you should include both animal and human studies. And that is because the animals generate a more um, detailed uh, knowledge about very different uh, feeding strategies and you can look upon specific components uh, that will influence the development and growth and immunity. Um, when we do uh, enteral nutrition, we do it because we want to mature the intestine of the premature. Um, the premature uh, birth can induce gross restriction and delayed uh, neurodevelopment, but if we give a good amount of protein, we can maybe improve uh, the volume of the brain and also positively improve the cognitive outcome. Um, in premature piglets, at least, uh, colostrum products uh, will protect against uh, uh, NEC when you compare it to the preterm formula. And in the infants, mother's milk or donor milk will protect against uh, NEC compared to a preterm formula. You should give minimal intranutrition at least within the first 24 hours, uh, and then you should gradually increase your enteral feeding. How fast? We don't know yet. Protein content in both mother's milk and donor milk is not sufficient to ensure growth and development, so fortification is needed. And uh, I think we should stop performing aspiration because I think uh, it gives less uh, benefit than, uh, than negative uh, influences. Now, all this knowledge goes into uh, guidelines, and guidelines are nice because then we can... Uh, I won't say put a head under the arm and then just do whatever everybody else is doing. But it's very good that we sort of do it in the same way, especially when we talk about outcomes. So there's a lot of uh, um, guidelines, European guidelines, Chinese guidelines, uh, American guidelines, national guidelines and local guidelines. We maybe do not need uh, 
so many guidelines, just maybe one or two guidelines. Um, the current ESPGAN guideline is from 2010 and it recommends uh, fluid amounts uh, between 135 to 200 milliliters per kilo per day if you are feeding on only mother's milk. If you are having formula or fortified mother's milk, they recommend 150 to 180 milliliters per kilo per day. You should have uh, between 110 and 135 kilo, uh, kilocalories per kilo per day. Uh, you should uh, divide your protein um, um, supply uh, according to weight and fat you need to have uh, between 4.8 and 6.6 6 grams per kilo per day and carbohydrates above uh, around about 12, kilo, 12 grams per kilo per day. But this guideline is going to be, um, well, I think they will go through it and then they will come with a new recommendation, but probably not until one or two years. So it's going to be reviewed. Yes? Thank you for this.